Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sri's daily global COVID-19 show. My name is Sri Srinivasan, and it's my honor to gather this daily conversation with all of you around the world. If you're watching right now, please share this on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and on LinkedIn. We are live on Save the Post Office USPS Day of Action. We are talking about the current crisis and we have two fabulous experts who will put it into context. Today is episode 165. We've been on the air for 165 straight days of the lockdown in New York, every single day, including the weekends. So thank you for being with us. Thank you for your support. Our episode, Saving the US Post Office. Our experts, Professor Richard John, at RR John R on Twitter from Columbia University and Professor Manisha Sinha, Professor M Sinha on Twitter from the University of Connecticut. You will meet both of them in just a couple of minutes. Please stay tuned and please share this with your friends and family. Hi everyone, I'm Sri. Thank you for being here. I'm the Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation at Stony Brook School of Journalism and the co-founder of DigiMentors a social, digital, and virtual events consulting company. Our motto, don't cancel your event without talking to us. Don't even start planning your virtual event without talking to us first. My email address is right here. We'd love to talk to you. Even if it's just to chat about virtual events, we love to geek out. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your support. We're live on multiple platforms right now, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and on LinkedIn. If you've never seen the show before, We've been on the air for 165 days. We've had more than a million viewers, 105 million social impressions, 281 guests through the first 150 episodes, 158 of them women. We're going to up that ratio. We've had doctors, nurses, authors, journalists, CEOs, founders, teachers, professors, speakers from 57 cities and 16 countries, including the chief scientist of the World Health Organization. We're able to do this because we're in partnership with Scroll.in and Scroll Global, please follow them. And please check out our archives on YouTube, youtube.com slash Srinet, hit that subscribe button. And a big thanks to our producers, Rose Horowitz and Vandana Menon. Rose Horowitz is Rose Horowitz 31 on Twitter and Vandana is Vandana underscore Menon. We're also able to do this only because of the support of our sponsors. So let's give a shout out to Muckrack Academy, Fundamentals of Social Media, a course they helped me put together. It's free and available right now. Anybody anywhere in the world can participate and get a free certificate. The fundamentals of Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And you get a free certificate, mrac.co slash social, mrac.co slash social. More than 4,000 people have taken this course. You all know someone who would benefit from having this free course. Please tell them to check it out. And a big thanks to Nunbelievable, divinely delicious cookies on a mission. Each handcrafted cookie provides a meal to those in need. One cookie equals one meal, 20% off with the code SREE, S-R-E-E. -E. Please check out nunbelievable.com. We're also grateful to our friends at She's On Call a show that airs tomorrow, Sundays at 11 a.m. Eastern on Facebook, Twitter, and on YouTube. Our executive producers and co-hosts, Sujana Chandrasekhar and Marina Korean, two surgeons in New York, host their friends who are doctors from around the country and sometimes around the world. This week's guest, Dr. Doris Day, a dermatologist, and Dr. Valerie Fitzhugh, a pathologist. So join us on Sundays at 11 a.m. Eastern. And with that, I'm now ready to bring on our guest to talk about saving the post office. We're trying to understand the current crisis and also where things go and the latest developments and how all of this affects the election. So let me bring on stage here, Dr. Richard John and Dr. Mani and, and Dr. Manisha uh, Sinha, both of them professors, one at Columbia and one at Connecticut. And here we go. Good morning, folks. How are you? Good morning. Good morning, Sri. Thank you for being here. I know it's not easy on a Saturday morning, 
but thank you very much. So grateful to you. I hope you've had a chance to share this with your friends and family so that everybody around the world can join us. And those of you watching, please tag someone right now. They can watch this later if they can't watch it right now because this is such an important topic. My first question always to our guests, how are you, where are you, and how are you doing through the pandemic? Let me start with Manisha. Well, I'm in Massachusetts, uh, that's where I live, uh, and I'm fine. You know, we live in an area that is relatively um, not heavily populated. So, uh, and luckily, you know, the, the, the governments, the state governments in the Northeast have just done a much better job of uh, containing the pandemic. But yes, I've been in this office, my home office, since March. So you're pretty much seeing me where I've been confined for a long time. And, and that's a that's a fabulous office. You can see all the degrees in the back. Love it. And thank you for being here. Really appreciate you for your time. And let's say hi to Richard John. Richard and I taught together for more than 15 years at Columbia. And uh, Richard, how are you and how's the family? The family is well. My daughter's off to uh, college, Carleton, two weeks. Son's returning to Columbia. He'll be uh, online. Uh, my daughter will be on campus, but the courses will probably be online. The last six months, since March 15th, I have been in an oblong bounded by 58th Street, 125th Street, the Hudson River, and Fifth Avenue. Though this afternoon, I am going upstate to visit friends. We had My daughter and I had COVID tests last week. We're both negative. So I'm going to be leaving the island. Uh, for the first time in many, many months. <laughs> wow, that is that special that you were able to stay safe. And this is the thing, and now you're able to get out. But I, our, our motto at our house has been that, you know, we've made it to 165 days. Let's just keep it going <laughs> as long as we can. But we are lucky in the Northeast, uh, watching in horror as what we are we went through is now, you know, spreading in so many other parts of the country and uh, very, very sad. Today is the US Postal Service Day of Action to save the post office. Uh, so let's uh, talk a little bit about that and the context for a lot of folks. Remember, we have an audience, global audience. Please tell us where you're watching from. Uh, they may not all understand this war with the post office that uh, is going on right now. So Manisha, if you can start us off with your thoughts on the context of this, and then we'll go to Richard. Um, sure. You know, um, I should just uh, clarify that those are not my degrees. Those are actually uh, framed uh, photographs uh, or rather certificates for uh, the safe spots, a history of abolition, all the prizes it won. And I didn't want to put it in my office uh, in school. I put it at home thinking no one will see those. But of course, <laughs> I've seen that constantly since March. And so it's a little embarrassing. But in any case, uh, to your question, Sri, um, you know, I didn't think that there would be such a concerted attack on the United States Postal Service, though, of course, the Republican Party has uh, been uh, steadily undermining uh, all kinds of functions and social services performed uh, by the U.S. government. But, of course, the USPS is kind of iconic because, you know, it's been there forever. Uh, there's a mandate for it in the Constitution. Benjamin Franklin was one of our first postmaster generals. So uh, the idea that they would go after it in order to undermine the elections is actually pretty horrifying, especially in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I should also say that, you know, having written this book on abolition, it reminded me a bit of the attack on the postal offices uh, in the South uh, during the 1830s, when uh, abolitionists were mailing uh, pamphlets and newspapers down South in an effort to convert slaveholders uh, to see the light and, and to realize that, of course, uh, what they were doing was a moral enormity. Uh, it did not convert slaveholders, but their reaction to it was actually to storm post offices. Uh, the most famous incident took place in Charleston in 1835, where they made a bonfire of all the abolitionist literature. Uh, and the Jackson administration, uh, the postmaster general, Amos Kendall, decided to just look the other way when this was happening, uh, including the, the postmaster in New York City actually tried to prevent abolitionist literature being mailed. So 
one can see some parallels today, but hopefully not the kind of gigantic bonfire that they had uh, in Charleston, which is probably more reminiscent of what the Nazis did with books uh, that they decided were not um, to be, you know, uh, read by their population. Uh, but this kind of attack on the US Postal Service is extremely frightening. Uh, and I think uh, most uh, Americans and certainly even Republicans should step back and think of the precedent. Uh, you know, slaveholders did that. And if they want to, to undermine the US Postal Service, they might think about the precedent in American history and, and think about which side they're allying with and, and where their future points to. Um, so yes, uh, you know, historically, I think, uh, you know, Richard is the one who has written the book uh, on the U.S. Postal Service. So I'm going to let him take it from there. Uh, but as a historian of slavery and abolition, I find this attack rather alarming. Sorry, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and everyone, please follow Manisha and Richard. Manisha is at Professor M. Sinha on Twitter. And Richard is R.R. John on Twitter. Please follow them. And just so that everybody understands, this is the side that they are allying with when they attack the Postal Service for whatever reason, the, the, the slave owners who attack abolitionist literature, the bonfire, may not be physical now, it may not be lit with a match and gasoline, but it is very similar on the digital stage. So let us bring in Professor Richard John, who, as Manisha said, has written the book on the US Postal Service, and I'll show it in just a minute. Let's uh, talk to Richard about his take on where we are today. We're also gonna talk about the elections and what it means that the president is attacking the postal system and calling mail-in voting a fraud. So we'll understand the context of that history as well. So over to Richard. Well, thank you very much. And, and Misha, I, I agree. The abolitionist males controversy does provide a context. I just did a little piece in the Columbia News uh, making an analogy between Donald Trump and Andrew Jackson. But let me take the, let me take the historical parallels in a somewhat uh, different direction. Most American presidents regard the post office with the kind of reverence that we would customarily uh, reserve for motherhood, apple pie, cute puppies, that sort of thing. Half million men and women working hard every day, make it possible for commerce to uh, proceed smoothly, make it possible for our grandmothers to get her uh, birthday card and so on. So this is, from my perspective, as someone who's looked at the post office over the long haul, very surprising. Uh, Andrew Jackson and Donald Trump both share uh, a, a willingness to make controversial statements about the post office. Donald Trump has called the post office a joke, which is an astonishing claim. No previous president has said anything remotely like that. Andrew Jackson made the, at the time, radical claim that Congress should ban the circulation of abolitionist literature, which outraged John C. Calhoun and other pro-slavery advocates, because of course Jackson himself is a pro-slavery advocate, because as Manisha so well explained, the preferred solution to the abolitionist postal campaign, which outraged both Jackson and Calhoun and many Southerners, the preferred solution was for the states to take action. And that's what Amos Kendall enforced, and that's what the New York Postmaster enforced. So we have two presidents who make outrageous statements. But they do it, it seems to me, for different reasons. Jackson, by 1835, had the post office under his control. It became a patronage arm of the federal government. The spoils system began the post office with Jackson's election, 1828. Uh, those of you who know American history uh, may have have remembered those sentimental accounts of the yeomanry kicking up their heels, going to the White House for the inauguration. Well, it was very expensive to travel in Washington. Not many yeomen came, but the would-be office holders came, and they came, in effect, to, uh, to, to mob the White House to make sure that they were not going to be, be go home empty-handed, that they were not going to 
failed to get their campaign promise, which were those lucrative postmasterships in the north. In the north, so Jackson politicizes the post office. Very few dismissals in South Carolina, but a lot of dismissals in Massachusetts, in New York, and Pennsylvania. So he politicizes the post office in a new way, and we could we could talk about why that is. It's interesting, but Trump is also politicizing the post office, but it's in a different age, and to the extent that I've been able to piece together what the intellectual justification is, it seems to be a radical libertarian project that believes in free market utopia, that if we unleash the forces of enterprise, that somehow we will be able to solve all our problems. The libertarians will say, if we privatize the post office, then in an hour we could, uh, we could somehow come up with alternative solutions. I think that's a fantasy. I think it's radical. As a historian, I lean toward uh, respect for institution and kind of a, a conservatism. Uh, but this radical libertarian impulse uh, has been backed by billionaires. What's remarkable about it, if, if a republic figure, is it has very little public support. The post office has over 90% approval rating. Uh, I listened to the hearings yesterday in the Senate. You have Wyoming Republicans who are who are speaking in laudatory terms about the post office. You've got uh, Republicans uh, from the South, Republicans from uh, the Midwest. Uh, no public figure other than the president has made such really uh, bizarre, uh, hurtful, and outrageous statements about a half million men and women who are working every day in conditions that are not of their choosing and that are often uh, threatening to their lives. Many postal workers have died uh, in order to make possible, in order to sustain this vital American institution, vital for commerce, vital for public life. The founders in 1792 uh, was a compromise, George Washington, James Madison, the idea was the post office is going to get a, a new mandate, different from the mandate of Benjamin Franklin, who saw it primarily as a fiscal vehicle to raise revenue for the crown and then to keep the nascent republic going so the lawmakers could communicate with each other. New rationale in 1792 that it's going to become a vehicle to link the government and the governed, a civic mandate. What could be more in keeping with the founder's vision than to use the post office today for mail-in ballots. I don't understand why the president is so contemptuous of the founders. Why can't we learn from the past? Why do we have to trample on institutions that have served us well for hundreds of years? Let's keep America great and support our post office. Manisha, your thoughts? Yeah, so a lot of them, as 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 Richard put it so well and so passionately, you know, um, I think uh, the notion that the postal service serves as a means of communication, as a means of linking and binding the country together is an extremely important idea. It's a very patriotic thing to do to support the U.S. Postal Service, to link people who may live in rural and isolated areas. And that's precisely what, you know, Benedict Anderson talked about in Imagine Communities, right? You link the nation together as an imagined community through these means, through its print culture. You think of the explosion of newspapers, the free press, uh, the U.S. Postal Service. You know, just recently in Maine, over a thousand chicks arrived dead to farmers in rural Maine because of the backlog created by this corrupt appointment of Louis DeJoy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, Trump is in a way even worse than Jackson because Jackson wanted to prohibit uh, abolitionist literature, right, through the actions of the federal government and, and Calhoun and et cetera, saying, no, 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 states' rights. Uh, if, if they can prohibit the postal, uh, you know, abolitionist literature, tomorrow they're going to emancipate our slaves, which is, of course, what they did. Uh, and Jackson takes a very strong stance against Calhoun during the, the nullification crisis, this, this conceit that Southern slaveholders had uh, that they could simply ignore and nullify federal law, uh, something that actually was revived in the South during the Obama regime. They called themselves the Tenthers. They believed in states' rights and they could just ignore the federal government. Mm -hmm. What we have now, of course, with Trump and the Republican Party are people in government who don't believe in government. Um, 
They are, as Richard said, radical libertarians, but this has been the part of the Republican Party agenda, at least since Barry Goldwater and Ronald Reagan, which is simply to dismantle the U.S. government, uh, the U.S. government that has traditionally uh, supported uh, states, uh, civil rights uh, for those oppressed by states, uh, certainly since Reconstruction and the civil rights era. There have been moments when northern states have tried to protect their rights, like in the implementation of the federal fugitive slave law, uh, and now against the Trump regime and its illegal and unethical actions. But as a whole, uh, people on the progressive side, on the left, have supported government functions. They have supported the social state and services. Um, attacking the U.S. Postal Service is the way that the Reagan regime undermined the New Deal state uh, and continue. I mean, now he wants payroll taxes. He wants to undermine Social Security. In the middle of the pandemic, they want to get rid of not only Obamacare, but even everything that FDR put in place. You know, Medicaid, Medicare, uh, and and Johnson and Lyndon Johnson uh, put in pay, place Medicaid, Medicare, everything that we associate with a good society. So I think the Trump regime is an, actually an existential threat, uh, not only to the U.S. Postal Service, uh, but to American democracy. I actually think Biden put it rather well when he said we are fighting for the soul of the American Republic. These are things, as Richard said, you know, the founders put in place. Now, the abolitionists, of course, always were one step ahead. Uh, as, I, as I write in my book, The Slaves' Cause, you know, um, Garrison, responding to the postal service crisis, uh, says, you know, we should be like Haiti. Look at this model uh, black republic born of a slave rebellion. There, the, U the postal service is free. You don't even have to pay to post uh, any letter because of its rather impoverished uh, population. Uh, that's what Haiti had. Uh, the Republic of Haiti had initially. Uh, you know, we should really think about how these uh, government institutions, how the U.S. Postal Service is something that unifies the American nation, something that every American citizen has access to and can actually, um, you know, uh, take advantage of uh, at very reasonable rates even though we see our rates going up. Congress has passed laws that has actively sought to kind of dismantle that a little bit. Uh, and we should think about that very seriously now uh, with Trump's threat. I should also point out Shree, that that's the hardcover, the, the, the paperback, it's sold all out. The hardcover is all gone, you know, the all 10,000 copies of it, but the, the paperback is still available. It is in Kindle and in uh, audiobook too. Uh, the paperback, if you notice, it has a different coloring. It's it's kind of white, red, and blue, a little more patriotic uh, than the hardcover. Uh, but um, but yes, I, I think it is important for us um, to... I can see your chat. Um, Sri, you uh, want me to respond? Yeah, so, so I will just uh, yeah. uh, tell everyone, first of all, thank mm -hmm. you both for being here. So we're, I'm learning so much, as are other people. Rachel Cooper says this conversation is so important. So grateful to get this history. Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar, who has our show with us tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern, she's on call. She says, when we learn history, we stop from we, we can stop from repeating it. Thank you, Professor John. So many other comments coming in as well. Rick Smolin, an amazing photographer and, and writer, says, Sri, in 1908, the post office prohibited the, uh, the sending of photographic postcards of lynchings through the U.S. Post mail. Ironically, the lynchings themselves continued, and the last documented lynching in America was in 1981, where the 19-year-old Michael Donald's body was found dangling from a tree in Mobile, Alabama. The murder was by members of the Ku Klux Klan. And uh, this is the, again, just to make it clear, this is the awful, terrible history that this president and his supporters are 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 enabling and. Uh, Sujana says, uh, thanks to Mani Professor Sinha as well. Jonathan Borstein is watching from the East Village in New York. He's watched 165 episodes in a row and has uh, helped us with so many guests as well. Thank you, Jonathan, for being here. And uh, we have so many other comments. Carla Baranakis is watching from New Jersey, former national copy chief of the New York Times and 
uh, a, a member of the continuous news desk that uh, re really helped change the way the New York Times covered the world. She is part of our team that does the New York Times read along. We read the New York Times out loud every single Sunday, 8.30 to 10 a.m. Eastern. It's a, a little unusual to do something like this, but we've been doing it for five years. Our guest tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. Eastern is John Byrne, the editor-in-chief and founder of Poets and Quants and the former top editor of Business Week and Fast Company. So please do join us tomorrow morning to uh, watch and learn as we read the print New York Times out loud on Facebook. We have a couple of other comments and then I'm gonna to go to Professor John. And Carla says she's going to the post office today. And today is Save the Post Office Day. The fact that we need a Save the Post Office Day and it's become so political is so awful. Vinita Gupta says, save USPS. USPS is essential. And a LinkedIn user says, hi from Plymouth, Michigan. Just made my sign to go demonstrate at my post office at 11 a.m. And just uh, so glad that there are people out there willing to fight for this. Paula Kiger is watching from Tallahassee. And thank you for being here. Paula is on our team at DigiMentor's amazing editor and producer. And Rick says, incredibly, postcards of lynchings were made on the spot with people posing for personalized cards. Well, let's have Richard John come back into this conversation. Richard, your thoughts about either these comments or the things we've been talking about so far. Yeah, but let me take it in a different direction. Let me be a bit of a contrarian, right? We have email, first class mail is declining. 20 somethings are asking, why do we need the post office? Uh, you know, government does some things, stops. Business does some things, stops. What's the, what's the reason today, as opposed to this rationale going back to the beginning? And of course, you can make a special case for vote by mail because of the pandemic. But let me make a more general case. And it picks up on what Manisha was saying about linking Americans together. First, I'm of the, I know that the appointment of DeJoy was controversial. I watched the hearings yesterday. David Williams resigned in protest from the Board of Governors because he felt he was unqualified. But Louis DeJoy has a long record of success as a self-made businessman in logistics. The post office is a logistics operation. It's the biggest in the world. Half of all the world's mail goes through the United States post office. And let's take him- One, one second, I did not know that. Well, half, half of all half. the world's mail. So let's take him at good faith He's made the straightforward pledge that the mail will go through, that the ballots will be counted, that of course that's what the post office is going to do. He hasn't said that. It may be he's like a deer in the headlights with President Trump. I don't know. Let's just take him in good faith. The House will have its opportunity on Monday. But he is part of a movement that contends that the post office is a business and not a service. And lawmakers have asserted that since 1970. It's not a dominant position, but it's been asserted. The post office is no longer a line item on the federal budget as it was before 1970. Between 1851 and 1970, the Postal Service generated less in revenue almost every year than it required from the General Treasury in order to cover its, uh, cover its expenses, right? So the post office was in debt, if you want to use that uh, phrase, for much of its history. Well, the park service is in debt, you know, schools are in debt, the military is in debt. It's a service. It's infrastructure. It's absolutely fundamental to commerce and daily life. And that's the case I want to make now for 20-somethings and for skeptics, maybe even including some libertarians. A recent op-ed in the Washington Post, why do we need the post office? Here's the case. You've moved to Kansas, and in Kansas, you have interstate highway. And the government has a study and it says, you know, not that many people drive on the interstate highway anymore. So let's just shut it down. We have a highway going north of Kansas, south of Kansas. Why don't you go to California through Texas? Nobody needs to go through Kansas anymore on an interstate highway. Well, wait a minute. You move to Kansas, the expectation that you have that basic infrastructure in place for your daily life so you can get about, you can do business and so on. That's the analogy with the post office. That's why it's not going to become a partisan issue, I predict. It would be suicide for the Republicans if it were, given their red state constituency, and why it has never been a partisan issue in the past, because it cuts across so many 
of our partisan divides because of the enormous importance, rural areas, small towns, as post office, as the very cornerstone of the community, as a, as a center for civic life. Second point here. So that's the first, the Kansas analogy. The second analogy is, I heard this from a very talented journalist the other day when I was on NPR. You, know, you probably don't worry about the post office too much if you live somewhere where you can hail a cab from your front door because you have a lot of options for transportation. There may be delivery services, okay? lots of ways for you to get about, to move about, and for delivery companies to come to you. Well, if you cannot hail a cab from your front door, then you may well be more dependent on the post office than you think you are. Even though half of the mail is advertising, so-called junk mail, parcels are coming to the post office, especially that vital last mile. Post office works very closely with Federal Express and with UPS. They run the airplane. Post office does the last mile. Environmentally, that makes sense. You don't have all those competing delivery trucks, but it also makes sense because FedEx and UPS do not have the organizational capabilities to match the post office. In 16 days, the post office delivers as many items as Federal Express and UPS deliver and all the other carriers deliver in a year. We don't quite have a grasp of how big and important the post office is and how central it is to American commerce, to day-to-day -day life. Small business people are terrified of losing access to the post office because that's how they get their supplies and that's how they reach their customers, right? Big retailers are concerned because they're trying to find a way in the COVID-19 world in order to get their goods through the distribution chain right to the final user. So those are some arguments about the post office that are a little bit different. Let's just assume good faith on the part of DeJoy, and I know that's contested. Elizabeth Warren and others are raising questions about it, but he's not just a political hack. This is a guy who's worked in logistics all his career. What's gonna be on his tombstone? Does he want it on his tombstone that he destroyed the post office? I don't think so. I think he wants it on his tombstone that he restructured the Postal Service for the 21st century. And that's what he said eloquently and with passion yesterday before the Senate. So let's hold him to it. But the joy does not run the show. He's got a president who's made really insulting and bizarre comments about the post office. But let's face it, the president makes insulting and bizarre comments about all sorts of things. Where does the buck stop? The buck stops with Congress. Because from 1792 onward, Congress has mandated that the post office should do X, Y, and Z. 1851 to 1970, the Congress just funded routinely every year whatever the postal surplus was. They debated about it in the law in the halls of Congress, and there's hundreds and hundreds of pages of, of uh, congressional bloviation, but no one else cared. They just paid the bill, and that was that, and the post office expanded. 1913, post office expanded to facilitate the circulation of parcels weighing up to 100 pounds. Before that time, it was blocked by shippers and merchants. They didn't want the post office to get into the parcel delivery business. In fact, a reformer 1870s in Congress, James Garfield, said, I want the post office to take over the telegraph because the telegraph circulates information and so does the post office. Ulysses S. Grant agreed. This was a position that had a great deal of support in the 1870s and 80s. In other words, Americans were more inclined to say, let's have the post office take over Western Union. Let's have the government take over the corporation. Then the corp no one wanted the Western Union to take over the post office. You've got to be kidding because the, the Western Union only served the 1%. Post office served the entire population, okay? In 1910, post office went into banking, provided credit for the five, six, seven percent of Americans who did not have access to credit. Elizabeth Warren has revived that proposal today. So Congress calls the shots. Congress is back in session. Congress has an obligation to solve the short term financial problem with a stroke of a pen and to deal with this festering challenge that the post office confronts, which are the pension obligations that go back to the 2006 uh, Postal Accountability Law. That was a mistake. It was perhaps negotiated in good faith, perhaps not. We don't know. We haven't done the historical scholarship. The vote was a voice vote. Get that off the books. Enable Louis DeJoy to do what he says that he wants to do. Ironclad assurance that no matter what our president tweets, that Congress and the post office are committed to ensuring that fundamental 
tenet of free government, which is a safe and secure election, which in COVID-19 uh, times is going to take place through the post office. Oregon's been voting by mail for 30 years. Many other states vote by mail. Trump himself is going to be voting by mail. Uh, so is Louis DeJoy. And Louis DeJoy just said it straightforwardly. He had no conception that anything he's going to do is going to undermine the sanctity of the mails or the election. It's not a big deal to deliver 100 million ballots for the post office. Not a big deal at all. But you've got to make it clear and transparent to the American people that you are 100% committed and the post office has lost control of the narrative in the last couple of weeks and it has become fodder for these radical libertarian utopians who are dangerous. They are not in keeping with our best traditions and they would have uh, absolutely astonished the founders. And I believe we should get back to basics, fund the post office, and make this great institution what the 500,000 men and women who are working for the institution fully intended to be. Thank you. you Let me share your thoughts. Um, so, you know, I have less faith in Louis Joy than Richard does. Uh, you know, here is a man who is clearly a successful businessman. Uh, and maybe he thinks he's introducing, quote, efficiencies uh, into the postal system. But uh, in the guise of that, he can do a lot of harm and a lot of damage. Uh, as Richard pointed out, there is actually a law that was passed that was so unreasonable in terms of funding pensions. Uh, of the U.S. Postal Service that it purposely put it in the red when at least since the 70s it has been a highly profitable uh, uh, concern. Um, but the idea that somehow the U.S. Postal Service uh, should be uh, made more efficient, I mean, Louis DeJoy, the reason why we trust him is because he says he has now rescinded all those orders. Uh, that, in fact, uh, he has not made sure that uh, people are not given overtime, or etc. He has rescinded everything that he has done. But, in fact, post offices have been, uh, post boxes have been dismantled and uh, sorting machines have been dismantled. I mean, this is just ast astounding to me. Now, Trump lies all the time, of course. He said he would build up the infrastructure of the country. In fact, he is destroying, actively destroying the infrastructure of our country. All our enemies want Trump to win because he will make us into a third world country. He will, in fact, dis put an end to the American century. They have actively dismantled sorting machines. Is he going to now put them back together? I don't think so. So, you know, I, I you know, he may be fantastic at his business and figuring out the logistics of this. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the U.S. Postal Service, in fact, does a fantastic job of managing enormous amounts of mail, things that we can't even think about. And for that, they do need those sorting machines. They do need the overtime in order to function efficiently. There's both some concern, oh, how will they man manage all the millions of uh, mail-in ball ballots? You know, this is one of Trump's uh, favorite talking points because, of course, he wants to completely undermine democracy and elections. Uh, you know, well, they handle billions of pieces of mail during Christmas. You know, Americans love to send cards. I know that. I, I do something for my neighbors and they send me a thank you card, even though they live right across the street from me. So I, I know we love to send mails and I'm very much into the Christmas card uh, business too of sending, you know, hundreds every year. Uh, so if they can do that, you know, they can certainly manage millions of uh, mailer voting ballots um, in, a, in the middle of a pandemic, that is in fact an essential service uh, and we need it. We need the U.S. Postal Service. So I'm really astounded. The other thing that I would say, it's not just the radical libertarians. It's the Republican Party. The Republican Party is actively against government. It's against any government services. They want to privatize everything. And, and as Richard said, you know, I think it is important, in fact, to beef up the services of the U.S. Postal Service, go back to banking, uh, go back to them taking over all kinds of other services, because, you know, that's something that is such a reassuring constant in, in these really awful times under the Trump regime. You know, the, the mailman delivering your mail every day, they want to cut back on mail service. Uh, for some people, it's the, the only contact that they have to the outside world. Uh, I heard of a story recently of a person who had died in her home all alone. And the only person who noticed that something was wrong was her mailman. 
because her mail kept piling up and she wasn't taking her mail in. And in, he, he, you know, called the police and they actually discovered that she had uh, passed away. So, you know, there, there, there are just so many stories in terms of what the U.S. Postal Service means as a national symbol of unity in a time that is so scary and so divisive because, of course, Trump, you know, like slaveholders, by the way, they, they, they really model them so beautifully that I, I think they may have actually read them and are following their, their, their footsteps, um, you know, has raised these divisive ideas that only certain groups of people are true American citizens. You know, it's, it's rather laughable to hear him say those sort of things, uh, but he's a great divider. And in the face of that, the U.S. Postal Service is a great unicorn. Right. You know, and, and I wonder whether he even thinks of his rural base. He really doesn't, because in the southern states where the pandemic is spreading, they 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 they, they uh, traffic in all kinds of lies and conspiracies uh, about the COVID-19. Uh, they use racist ideas. Uh, they pretend to be very strong national patriots, but they're the most treasonous, unpatriotic bunch I have ever seen. Uh, and they are going to destroy this country, including its essential services, if we don't get rid of all of them this November. So, yes, save our U.S. Postal Service, vote, and 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 give them a drubbing. They need they belong to the dustbin of history because at this point they are attacking uh, the very you know Joe Biden calls it the soul, but I think they are attacking the American Republic in a way that is frightening. Uh, I will let Richard uh, weigh in here in just a minute. Folks, you're watching a conversation with two eminent historians as we try to understand the U.S. Postal Service, the current crisis, the elections in November, what it means. Uh, and uh, we will talk a little bit more specifically about the elections in just a minute. I want everybody to follow Professor Richard John. He's at RRJohnR on Twitter. Please follow him. And Manisha Sinha is Professor M. Sinha on Twitter, Prof. M. Sinha on Twitter. Please follow her as well. It's great to see historians taking to Twitter and, and, and sharing their thoughts and views and their scholarship in a much more accessible way. And you can tell that these are both very accessible scholars already. I want to go to Richard and hear his thoughts. And then I want him to tell us about the two books he has behind him. Maybe he can hold them up and uh, tell them uh, tell us about both those books that are behind him. Well, let me just, I want to uh, follow up on two things that Manisha said. Uh, the first is this question of the mailboxes and the sorting equipment. This has been an extraordinarily uh, vivid symbol of the problems with delivery, which have spiked up as the uh, uh, Delaware senator so perceptively and straightforwardly observed on Friday. They've spiked up since DeJoy has taken office. Now, the reason this that the deliveries slowdown has occurred may well have nothing to do with the removal of the post, post boxes and the sorting equipment. Those were, post office is a big organization. It does not turn on a dime. And those decisions were made before DeJoy came. Now, you could say they're bad decisions, that's fine. But it's not specifically anything DeJoy has done. DeJoy, interestingly, on Friday in the Senate hearings, uh, spoke up for Saturday mail delivery, which is in fitting with his kind of logistical background. So I'm willing, at least for the moment, to give him the benefit of the doubt. He spoke under oath before cameras for the Senate about his commitment to making the institution run. I'll give him that. All right. The president's statements remain outrageous and unconscionable, but that's different. But let me go in a different place. When Manisha said the post office made money since 1970, and it, it did, in fact, uh, bring in in some years more than it paid out. But this language of the post office as a business, putting it into the realm of profit and loss, is misleading and I believe destructive. The Boston Globe had a fine editorial this morning on the post office. We said flat out the post office doesn't, isn't in debt to anything. It owes zero because it's a service. We don't expect the park service to turn a revenue. We don't, to turn a profit. We don't expect um, the water company to make a lot of money. Uh, we have public services. The post office is a service, not a business. Uh, the Speaker of the House, uh, Speaker Pelosi said that recently, and that is in keeping with our long 
uh, tradition. Now you can say, well, chuck the tradition, chuck the past. Well, as a historian, I have a certain reverence for institutions that Manisha put it so well, have bound the nation together to this imagined community. If the post office is still running, somehow civilization is, 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 is still chugging along and it's all right with the world. And if we get rid of that, uh, which could happen, I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, there is no uh, partisan uh, uh, lobby in Congress uh, to defund, excuse me, to, to privatize the post office, although there is a defunding lobby, which basically means they're concerned about the money the post office is getting. But I don't believe that, that there's a will in Congress uh, the problem here is that we have a misalignment between Congress, the American people, the Postmaster General, and the President. And the President, for reasons that we could speculate about, I think Manisha has laid some of them out very well, has made uh, astonishing, uh, uh, un-American statements about the selection and the relationship with the Post Office. And that means that it is absolutely essential that Americans believe that the election is legitimate and the proceedings of the post office need to be transparent. Because there's a bigger issue than who wins or loses in November. The bigger issue is the legitimacy of our experiment in self-government. And if I heard the Postmaster General's testimony yesterday, I think he gets that. I hope he gets that. And for the sake of our experiment in uh, self-government, he should get that because I don't think it's, he wants it on his tombstone that he helped to destroy the republic. And a fair and safe election is essential to the legitimacy of the republic. Now, you want me to talk about my books? Is that what you want me to do? Yeah, just tell uh, us about the books, the two books behind you. Yeah, one is by myself and one is not by myself. That's um, fine. Just hold them up. Can you just right, hold them up? Yeah. All right, I'll get them to you. Um, this is a book that has the same cover and paperback that <laughs> she was asking called Spreading the News, the American Postal System from Franklin to Morse. I published it in 1995. The internet had not yet been commercialized. Uh, you could not do online <laughs> source searches for primary documents, but it tells the story of the Post Office Act of 1792, the expansion of the post office in the 1820s, and the challenge that Manisha described so well with the abolitionist mails controversy and the spoil system under Andrew Jackson. So it, it, it kind of, talks about the foundations, where we've been, what did the founders believe, why was the post office so important in an age when the post office was the primary vehicle for the circulation of information on public affairs. Newspapers massively subsidized through the post office. 95% uh, of the weight of the mail, never more than 15% of the revenue. We had public funding for journalism, the early republic. That's what the founders believed was necessary to sustain the Republic. And by the way, we also had privacy. That is to say, it was illegal to open anyone's letters. Now, what if the internet was governed on the same principle? Privacy. The norm that there will be no surveillance of anyone's emails. So that's the American tradition. And that is the tradition that sadly we have departed from. So this is a back to basics book. What are the core values that created the information infrastructure that made possible the imagined community that Manisha described so well. In fact, one of the chapters of the book is entitled The Imagined Community. Now, here's the second book. Uh, this is a one, oh, I got to get the name out there, by a, uh, a very fine a journalist who worked Time Magazine for many years, a dear friend, Winifred Gallagher, How the Post Office Created America. Uh, she tells the story from the 18th century right through to the present, she tells it with a verve and brio, as only a seasoned journalist who's published a half dozen, maybe more books, uh, can do. And that's the one book, if you want to know about the whole history of the post office, that's the book I turn to. It's a great read. It was published by, uh, what was it, uh, Mass Market uh, Publisher, uh, Penguin Press. Uh, it's intended for the general reader who wants to know the whole story in under 200 pages. If you're interested in learning more about the early history, where we've been, uh, this is a book with a lot of you know references to primary sources, but there are a lot of characters in there too. That would be the book I turned to. So those are the two books you wanted me to talk about. Yeah, I feel as if I should have got a copy of my book with me. <laughs>
<laughs> but, uh, but I do want to add one thing to to the points that are being made today, and I think they're really important. Besides creating that kind of unity uh, for the American nation, the Postal Service actually has operated in really egalitarian ways. Uh, it has provided employment uh, to working class people and to particularly African Americans historically. Uh, you know, you, one of your uh, commentators mentioned how the U.S. Postal Service prohibited the circulation of lynching postcards, yeah. which continued to circulate in the South, but the U.S. Postal Service prohibited that. We also know that during the era of Jim Crow, uh, many actually uh, Southern state governments and local governments tried to prevent material from reaching African Americans in the Deep South sharecroppers, tenants who were locked into this oppressive regime of segregation and racial terror. They could get, you know, uh, uh, black newspapers, uh, the Chicago Defender. They could get uh, catalogs uh, from Sears and Montgomery Ward, uh, you know, again, uh, owned by people who were very philanthropic towards uh, black education. Uh, and local and uh, state officials at that time were a little worried that that would make African Americans more sensible of their rights as American citizens and more able to participate in society and democracy in equal ways. So in many ways, the history of race and the U.S. Postal Service is also very interesting that somewhat doesn't get looked at. Uh, and it's true for all government services. You know, the federal government, the U.S. Armed Forces, have historically provided avenues for African Americans when you had these very entrenched systems of uh, racial inequality in the private sector. And I would reinforce what Richard says, you know, uh, everything is not, you know, governed by uh, the profit motive or privatizing instincts. There is something called the common good. We have a government. This is like a basic precept of American republicanism, putting the common good over your private gain. That is something that the Republican Party has totally lost sight of. They think that their private gains are the common good, which it clearly is not. Once you lose that basic precept of American republicanism, you can put your self-interest up so that you can sell your national security to the highest bidder, that you can hang on to power and completely destroy our electoral systems and our democracy and uh, our uh, postal service system uh, without with impunity and think, oh, this is this is all good. And so I think it's really important to remember that there are certain things that government does. The very logic of government is there to protect the common good. You know, we want government to regulate our waters. We want them to get rid of tainted meat. For God's sake, we had this conversation during the progressive era when we had unhinged capitalism in the United States. We want to protect our people. We want to provide them services. That's what government does. The fact that we have to even explain that to people is astonishing. And the fact that the Republican Party has devolved into this anti-American, un-American, anti-government cabal run by a bankrupt businessman who's just a showboat and who is completely lying all the time is horrifying. And now you think, what is their base? Well, apparently a group of people who think they're Satanists running the world. You know, this is a level of um, stupidity that I think will destroy the country unless it is actually, you know, actively defeated and put down. Uh, and saving, you know, the fact that we have to even talk about saving the U.S. Postal Service is is, is astonishing to me. Um, Thank you, uh, John. Uh, Richard, I'll, I'll come to you in just a second. Sure. We're, we're almost out of time. Let's just sure. look at some of the comments. Uh, eight, uh, eight Third Power says, the post office is a business and a service to civilians. Watch Amazon start moving mail with your Prime membership. It would be free. I guarantee you it would not be free if Amazon took over. Uh, Carla says, let's get hats that say make USPS great again. And uh, uh, Nikhil Hathi Singh says, amazing stats. I didn't know about the post office. Uh, those she, He didn't know about those stats. And your comments helped to distill the effects of Trump's actions on America. 
Thanks for your really insightful analysis. Carla says Zoom or whatever platform Congress uses is not DeJoy's best medium. And then uh, Ashok says traditional methods of communication are a mega effort and only governments can handle this. Privatization, it's only a fashion statement. Globally, it's not worked. Must understand the difference between service and business, period. This is someone in Mumbai uh, talking about this. Rick Botello says, to address the anti-democratic assault on the post office, we have to address this question. How can we, the divided states of America, develop heroic credos of patriotism to deconstruct the deep state of fake patriotism? And on LinkedIn, please find Rick and please connect with him. He has a whole article and movement that he's starting on the rigged system. Uh, Charles is watching from North Caldwell. Charles Conan Carroll is an inventor who talked about how he he was on our show a few Saturdays ago talking about invention and how everyone here can invent and reinvent. So please check out that show. All 165 episodes are on my YouTube. Please check them out. We've got a lot of smiles coming from Jay and uh, Vandana has linked to the various books, including Winifred Gallagher's book, as well as uh, the book by uh, by Richard. And we are going to, and we know that we already talked a little bit about uh, the book that Manisha wrote, "The Slaves' Cause." And uh, and and Manisha, I, with, in your final thoughts, I'd like you to talk about the book one more time. Chris is watching from Manhattan. Alyssa says we need a grassroots approach to deliver election ballots and have them picked up and returned to the electoral office. And here's Vandana on Manisha's book from Yale, A Slave's Cause. So with this, I'm gonna give uh, each of you a chance to give us some final thoughts. Uh, let's, let's talk about what can we do in terms of the elections themselves? Like are people, should they be asking for an, uh, a mail-in vote? And how does, this is the question that uh, Trump is injected confusion into this, if I mail in my vote as I voted, and then can I go and vote in person? How do they know and how do they count those? That is something that he's injected this confusion into everything. So either of you, as you're talking, please do address that or both of you. And then what should we be looking for? We're 73 days away from the election. So Richard, I'll start with you because I know you have to run. So we'll let you go first and then Manisha will stay and, um, and I will chat for a minute if that's okay. So Richard, please go ahead first. Yeah. Very quickly, there is a book on African Americans in the post office by Phil Rubio. There's always work at the post office. So if you're interested in African Americans in the post office, a very important subject, that's the place to go. What can we do? Ordinary Americans have been petitioning Congress for postal service improvements since the 1790s. Calling congressmen, uh, phoning congressmen, uh, going today to the protests, all this is Perfect is very much in keeping with what Americans have done, and it's been extraordinarily effective in the past. That's one reason we have such an extensive postal network. Americans demanded it, and Americans balked and protested when there were efforts to shut it down or to limit access. So that's one thing. But the second is just to look at the history of voting by mail. Soldiers have been voting by mail since the Civil War. Uh, in Oregon, they've been voting by mail uh, for 30 years. There have been many studies. There's an infinitesimal possibility of voter fraud, much more likely to be fraud with machines that do not have paper ballots. And it seems to me we should begin asking, why do we have voting machines that do not have a paper trail? That is an issue uh, that if we want to be concerned about the sanctity of the election, that we could shift our attention to. But just to remember that we've been mail-in voting for a very long time, and for the president to claim as he has, astonishingly to me, that it's safe to vote by mail in Florida and not in Nevada is, is pushing hypocrisy and, and uh, is pushing the bounds of credulity, even for the current incumbent of the White House, which is a very, very low bar. So I think we should just ask some questions about the history of voting rights in the United States. And why is it that we hear about fraud before elections when there is great concern about minorities, the poor, outsiders getting to the polls because as the uh, I think it was a North Carolina senator uh, said so eloquently yesterday these are the weapons that have been used by white supremacists in the past to block outsiders and I, I would hope we are past that it does not appear that we are but if we keep that history uh, in our forefront then we'll be in a better position to address the challenges that we confront today and what about that issue of the voting if I vote by mail what happens at the polling poll? 
polling all the studies suggest that there is no fraud that they are able to track who the voter is on the basis of the poll books they just cross you off uh they will not uh because when you go to vote in the polls at least in manhattan where i vote you go to the poll watcher they will put your name down and then they get the ballot in and they're going to check the two against the address so they're only going to count one vote because we should only have one vote per american and that's something that i think we can all agree on i think so richard john thank you very much columbia university professor my colleague for more than 15 years at columbia journalism school when i was teaching there a pleasure to see you and i still have your gettysburg uh uh tour suggestions because oh, i have yeah. my kids there so i can't <laughs> wait to that. when all of this uh, stuff is over and who knows when that is. Thank you very much, Richard. Great to see you. Manisha, thank you for staying for another minute. Thank you very much. Bye, Richard. Bye, bye. Thank you. R. R. John R. Uh, on Twitter. And we'll have, we'd love to have you back uh, to talk more about all of this. Thank you very much, Richard. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Sri. Good to see you. Good to see you, Manisha. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye. Bye, Richard. So, yeah, Sri. So that was all very interesting, you know, and, and, and Richard's right. The hypocrisy is amazing because, of course, Trump and the Trump administration, his family, they all vote by mail. Uh, the notion that there's some fraud going to happen if you vote by mail is, again, one of those uh, lies that Trump regularly espouts uh, because there has been no fraud. In fact, voting by mail is extremely safe and it is exactly the kind of thing that we should have access to during the pandemic. And when they're predicting a second wave this winter, every American citizen should have access to vote by mail. Uh, the notion that it creates fraud, I mean, I voted by mail for the first time in the Democratic primaries in Massachusetts this year. I always usually go in person and vote, but this year I decided I'm going to do it by mail and it went so smoothly. Um, and there's no way that, in fact, fraud can be committed. What has happened, of course, is our Republicans who are very interested in voter suppression uh, because they know they cannot win uh, if everyone votes. They know they cannot win on the strength of their program, which is totally nihilistic now, uh, and it's destructive of the republic itself. Uh, so they create these racist fantasies of illegal voters. We know voter suppression is a much bigger problem in the United States than voter fraud. Uh, and even with all that, they still continue to lose the popular vote. With all the suppression, and especially in the South, that has a history of suppressing the black vote. They've gotten so adept at suppressing the vote through various ways that they are going to continue doing this. Now, interfering with the U.S. mail is a federal crime. Uh, so that is perhaps one of the safest ways that one could vote, and people should know that. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, I, I just think that these elections, everyone should have an option that one of the first things that the Democrats should do if they get into power and manage to defeat Moscow Mitch and the entire cabal in the Republican Party, which is now literally uh, doesn't believe in science, doesn't believe in history, doesn't believe in the basic tenets of American republicanism or government, uh, is to, in fact, reinforce our democracy, reinforce the postal service system, reinforce um, voting. Uh, all those reforms that President Obama mentioned are extremely important. Make voting a national holiday, like most democratic countries do, so that poor people, working class people can vote. Why are Americans so apathetic? Why is it that less than a majority of our population votes? It's because voting is so difficult and it makes it really tough if you are a working person and it encourages cynicism in the system. So we really need to reinforce all these things in order to save the U.S. Postal Service. And I should also mention that the postal workers have an action day. Somebody just tweeted that uh, on August uh, 25th, Tuesday. And I would encourage everyone to participate in support of the U.S. Postal Workers Union. That was the first one. To the the canary in the coal mine, they they first sounded the alarm at uh, the Trump regime's and Louis DeJoy's attempt. And then, let's not forget, Louis DeJoy is a huge Republican contributor. That's how he got his office, not because he's some great uh, businessman. You know, his main qualification is a Republican donor. So to politicize it, and you know, all the frauds that we know have been committed, in fact, by Republicans, Republican operatives who have actually voted three or four times in different constituencies and have been found out. 
So, you know, they talk about voter fraud, you know, maybe they shouldn't because much of the fraud that has been recently discovered has been done by Republican operatives. And we just cannot let them al allow them to steal another election as they did in 2000. Uh, it is about time that majority opinion, majority rule prevailed, that one person has one vote and that vote should count no matter who you are, what you look like, what your religion is, as long as you're an American citizen, you should have that sacred right to vote and you should allow the U.S. Postal Service to convey it. Thank you, Manisha. Here is uh, Cherry. Terry Ann is watching from Trivandrum and Kerala. Uh, have you been to uh, Kerala? I did as, 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 a, as a child. Uh, my parents uh, did a, a whole tour of the South. You know, my father was named Srinivas, uh, even though we are from the North, by my grandfather because he was uh, admired, uh, uh, an Indian freedom fighter and orator from the South uh, called Srinivas. So oh. My father's name is actually Srinivas Kumar Sena, so it's S-R-I, unlike yours. Uh, yours is double E. Uh, and uh, we went on a tour of the South, as my father always said, the civilized part of the country. And <laughs> so we went all over. Uh, and apparently it was so hot that I fainted and they had to, to revive me. I got a heat stroke. Uh, but uh, so that, you know, I, I want to take my husband, who is uh, German and a newly minted American citizen, uh, I want to take him down uh, and do a tour of the of the South. And it's one of my big wishes to go to Kerala, to go to Kanyakumari, to go to Trivandrum. So I'm yeah, going to do that. Uh, please let us know when you, whenever you do get a chance to plan that, because I know there'll be people who want to meet you and, 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 and talk to you. I know my parents would love to say hello as well. Kanyakumari, or uh, as uh, some people uh, will know and many people won't, is uh, the very southern tip of, of, of India, where you can see three bodies of water come together, much like Cape of Good Hope. You have the Bay of Bengal, the Indian Ocean, uh, and the Arabian Sea all come together at K uh, Kanyakumari. It used to be known as Cape Comorin back in the day. And uh, so I'm, I'm glad you're going to be taking him at some point. Ashok from Mumbai says, if non-government operator takes over, it will be doomed. Look at the telecom private operators ruined the service aspect totally and forced marketing sledgehammers where are we with them uh and uh, rick says uh sri uh will you have a show to discuss fake and true patriotism uh let, let, let's let's talk about that uh there's so much going on uh here is apollo watching from vegas says DeJoy is evil he's removing capacities built into usps for times of national emergency so he can create a market for his firm xpo logistics uh, love your historiography professor sinha and uh, uh paulo who was a guest on our show from vegas we talked about COVID in vegas he talked about what it's like to be a black man living in india he lived in delhi and uh, and shared some of his adventures uh, uh professor sinha are there vegas memories you can share for the public or not of your own. Las Vegas? Yeah, in Las Vegas. Yeah, yeah you know, um, it, I, you know, I have not, not been to Las Vegas and I have to say that I haven't had any particular <laughs> desire <laughs> to go to Las Vegas from everything that I've seen in the movies about Las Vegas. But, you know, maybe I will one of these days. I don't mean to diss the city. <laughs> I, I will go and, 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 and visit Las Vegas. Uh, you know, interestingly enough, doing all these history talks has taken me to all corners of the United States. I have been to you know, to Utah, to Idaho. I've been to airports where I was the only person left. Uh, you know, so it's it's been quite interesting. I've been to the south. I've been to areas uh, that look as poor and you know poorer than than villages sometimes in India. So the U.S. is a very diverse place, and I think our inequalities are just so disheartening, uh, especially when you compare them to uh, similar countries in Europe and Western Europe that uh, you know, provide all these basic safety nets for their citizens uh, and that we don't. Uh, and I, I think that the US would do so much better if we were able to uplift all our citizens. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I, you know, um, that, that's one, one or, I, I hate to sound like a stuck tape recorder there, but, uh, but no, it, I hear you. it's I hear important. You. Um, and I, I do think that, uh, yeah, we have to be very careful these elections. Because Trump is crazy. I mean, he's talking about sending troops to polling stations. And he talks like a tin pot dictator. And uh, we have to be extremely careful 
that he does not steal the elections. And everyone listening, uh, I have started a hashtag on Twitter, and I would like everyone to do this. Uh, I know journalists have to go there, but hashtag boycott the Republican National Convention 2020. Uh, and I think uh, we should just not watch their lies and their propaganda, uh, not give them any room to skew it. I am not going to watch them at all. I will digest all the lies. Uh, and the myths uh, through analysis of it. But I'm, not, I'm I'm going to tell all American citizens, do not watch them. Watch something else. Watch Netflix. Watch Mississippi Masala. That's a great movie. Uh, <laughs> Alan says he, he's not replacing what you, what you took away, the machines. We talked about that all, already. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, you're a South Asian who is an Indian American, who is a, a scholar of slavery and abolitionist. The, of the abolitionist era. Are there others uh, who are South Asian who uh, are uh, also covering this era as historians? Would love to know some other names as well. Yes, they are, in fact. And, uh, you know, unlike me, most of them are, have been born and brought up in this country. I became a nationalized citizen uh, when President Clinton was in power. I still have my letter from Bill Clinton uh, welcoming me as a citizen of the United States. Um, uh, I would recommend many, you know, Gautam Rao is, is, is really a fabulous uh, historian of slavery uh, and of actually, uh, you know, commerce and federal systems. And so he is one person I would really walk out for. Um, I'm a Civil War historian too. There are not that many Indian Americans in my field. Uh, but I would recommend uh, for the 20th century and even earlier, Vivek Ball, who is a uh, uh, South uh, or at least I think he's of Indian descent uh, at MIT, who wrote this wonderful book called Bengali Harlem, um, a, a great book to read. Uh, Nikhil Paul Singh, who teaches at NYU, um, uh, has written wonderful books on democracy and race uh, in the 20th century. Um, so there, there are a lot of us now in the humanities. When I first came to this country, I was, as I wrote in the New York Times piece, uh, I was an anomaly. Uh, but but there but there are lots, and I would definitely uh, recommend that people. Nayan Shah, who does wonderful work on race medicine. Um, so I'm thinking of all these names. I'm sure I've forgotten some, and they'll email me and say, "Well, you did mention me." <laughs> but uh, there there are numerous Indian Americans now. Uh, as you know, we are represented now pretty much in in in, in all fields, and and now I am somewhat excited at the idea of Kamala Harris. Uh, becoming the vice president. Uh, of course, uh, typically, if there are five South Asians that get together, they make an association. So, a so association of uh, South Asian American historians uh, would be uh, not uh, not 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 unheard of. But you're all too busy doing actual academic work. So, which is which is great. And uh, my uh, hero in understanding the Civil War has always been Eric Foner, uh, my colleague at Columbia, and uh, someone you know very well, of course. Yes, Eric was actually my advisor. Yeah. Uh, I'm a, a Columbia graduate, like uh, Dr. Ambedkar was. And um, yeah, he, I, he mentored me. I worked with him in Barbara Fields at Columbia University. I wrote my first book, uh, The Counter-Revolution of Slavery, which is on pro-slavery politics in South Carolina and the coming of the Civil War uh, under him. Uh, and in fact, when Nikki Haley took down the Confederate flag in South Carolina, I sent her a copy of my book. Of course, she never acknowledged it, and her trajectory has been downward since then. I hear she's one of the speakers uh, at the Republican National Convention, is totally identified with Trump. So there's a South Asian I, I do not admire at all. Uh, but yes, I, I did uh, work. My first book is actually on the politics of slavery and uh, was actually featured in the 1619 Project uh, by. Uh, Jamil Bowie in his article on the politics of slavery. Uh, when it first came out, all the Southern political historians were up in arms. Uh, but uh, yes, I, uh, I I like the fact that now it's uh, regarded as conventional wisdom. Apollo is giving some names. Uh, David Blight, Peter Colchin, Ira Berlin, are, uh, and are others I read at Amherst. Uh, mm -hmm. El uh, Alyssa is saying, even if we don't buy into their agenda, shouldn't we watch to know what lies are being perpetuated at the RNC. 
And yeah, go ahead. You, I'm sure you have a thought. There is a response from Ellen. You can read it in paper in, or, or Google what is being said. Rapid news reporting is available, so you don't need to. So your point is don't watch the RNC. You, in fact, we started a hashtag yeah. on boycotting it. Mm -hmm. I did. And, you know, I don't want them to get the ratings. I, I want them to realize that we are really rejecting them. Uh, and, you know, they have now, the Republican Party now has risen to Goebbels level propaganda. Uh, not only these bizarre QAnon uh, conspiracies, but the, but Fox News is basically uh, like the old Pravda. Uh, you know, they just tell lies all the time. It's Orwellian, uh, really, and it's kind of hilarious that they keep talking about deep state and the you know this, these conspiracies in the U.S. government uh, when they, in fact, are openly uh, part of a propaganda machine that consistently lies to a large majority of uh, the American population. And that's one of the reasons why I don't watch Fox News at all. Uh, I could watch Sean Hannity only through Jon Stewart making fun of him. Uh, these people are awful. They are personally despicable. They, you know, look at the things that they have done uh, in Fox News. Uh, they, they, are, they have no ethics. Uh, they, are not, they lack what Republican theorists called virtue political and civic virtue. They will say and do anything. Uh, and they will contradict themselves too, uh, happily. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why I don't watch the Republican National Convention. I know journalists, reporters have to, because they have to report on it. Uh, but I am not watching it. I will watch it much later. Maybe I will watch it uh, in um, YouTube, uh, though I don't want to give them one extra view either. So maybe I'll find a way to watch snippets of it. I will digest it uh, through critical analysis of it. Uh, but I think our media has to be really careful. They created this horror show called Donald Trump. Uh, and the way in which we have uh, puffed him up uh, through uh, social media, through Russian bots in Twitter, uh, you know, and through uh, his bizarre television reality shows, uh, this man is an abject failure, and if it wasn't for this this persona that is created around him uh, by lies and by propaganda, he would not even be the president of the United States. So I, I really, you know, at this point, I have reached a, a position like the abolitionist, no compromise with evil, you know, no union with slaveholders, no union with these people, because they're dangerous. If you can sell our national security out, you know, and I'm, I'm not a big national security person, right? But if you can sell our national security out to Russia, to China, to other enemies of the, of the state, if you can just violate with impunity our basic democratic principles, um, you know, you people are traitors. You are enemies of the state. We, the left, needs to, in fact, reclaim American patriotism because, these people pretend to be patriots, but they are in fact traitors, just like Southern slaveholders who said that they were upholding the US Constitution while they were destroying it and destroying the American Union. You have to unmute yourself, Sri. Thank you. You're teaching me. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, we're showing everybody this book by. Brian Stelter. It's called Hoax. It just come out. Donald Trump, Fox News, and the Dangerous Distortion of Truth. Everyone should check that book out because it's talking about many of the things that Manisha has been saying. And I hold the hosts at Fox News, not the journalists, but they are enabling them by not protesting and, and, and resigning. But the hosts at Fox News, the top of the, the morning show hosts on Fox and Friends, Sean Hannity, uh, people, Laura Ingram, uh, I'm, I'm holding them responsible for many of the deaths that have happened in this country because of that echo chamber that the president and they have. And together, they have uh, really spread the pandemic in a way that uh, it should not have. And we know today, for example, that we can save 69,000 lives if 95% of America wore masks. Right now, it's 55%. That 40% that's missing is the Fox News viewership is the Republican Party, are the conservatives that who swallow everything the president and Fox News say. If Sean Hannity didn't care about everybody else, but he cares about Americans that he that support him and the president the same way, 
why not just go on the air and let's save 69,000 lives by December? That is the estimate of what we could save if we have mask mandates throughout the country. And that is a tragedy to be discussed another day. Manisha, you have been with us for so long on your Saturday. Thank you very much. What does your weekend look like? I know during the week it's all Zoom calls. What is it on the weekend? Thank you. Well, it's uh, always, uh, I, I, I tend to do most of my Zoom webin webinars and calls during the week, but I was happy to do this. Um, and you're right, you know, uh, if people just wore masks, if they listened to Dr. Fauci, followed his five golden rules, we would be in much better shape. We would be like other countries in the world. In sense, we, we have the highest infection, highest death rates. We are the laughing stock of the world. I mean, I think India's death rate is actually better than ours. India's infection rate, a crowded poor country is better than ours. And so, you know, I, I really, and, and look at Georgia and all these other places. Not only do they don't want people to wear masks, but they're prohibiting local authorities from enforcing mask rules sometimes. So we really reach that stage where these people, you know, I just wonder if there's any reasoning uh, with them at all. But but you're right, my weekend looks fine. My, my son and his girlfriend are coming over. They've been, uh, you know, my son uh, works in Chicago, but we had him all summer because his company said he could pretty much work uh, from home until the end of the year. So that's been very nice. So I have become a real home buddy with a big family now. My son, his dog, his girlfriend, uh, and my other son, who is uh, luckily because Massachusetts has been somewhat sane in handling this crisis. We uh, actually, uh, he might have a, a hybrid system with some in-person learning in his school. Um, but yeah, that's my, 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 my weekend is my vegetable garden, making a lot of gazpacho, uh, just doing the things that I hadn't done for a long, long time. Uh, and I do have one book to blurb, uh, which I do always on weekends and evenings because uh, during the day I want to do my own work. <laughs> what are you working on for your next book? So my next book, which is already under contract with Livewright Norton, is on the reconstruction of American democracy after the Civil War. And it really speaks to a lot of the issues that we were talking about today. You know, this country needs a third reconstruction of American democracy, and I hope we get it with Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, but uh, and a Democratic Senate uh, and Democrats all down the line. Uh, but um, you know, it, it really talks about that missed opportunity after the Civil War when the country regressed uh, into uh, another sort of regime of white supremacy. Uh, and um, I've written a piece on this also in the New York Times, an op-ed comparing Donald Trump to Andrew Johnson. In fact, I don't think Donald Trump is like Jackson. Jackson was, was awful in many ways, but he was a patriot. And I can't say that about Trump. Uh, you know, Trump is a lot more like Andrew Johnson, the man who succeeded Lincoln uh, and nearly undid all the gains of the Civil War because he was such an unapologetic white supremacist. And this is one of the things that I hope to have you back to uh, talk about, because I think the South Asian community, a lot of us uh, never learned American history. And I hear even on my show, we have people in the comments uh, putting their name to things like, oh, didn't the, didn't the uh, slaves all get uh, so much land after this? So what is the, what are they complaining about? Using the terms that uh, are kind of racist dog whistles about welfare queens and, and terms like that, that I don't think they've ever had a chance to learn. As you know, many Indian Americans come here uh, after, you know, for grad school. So they never, you know, you become an engineer, you never learn anything about American history. And mm -hmm. they live these isolated lives where understanding American civics is not a priority. And so I would love to have you back to, you know, to talk about even the Civil War and Reconstruction. This is almost like they need a, a history lesson and it's so tragic that they do. And so my appeal to all Indian Americans, South Asians is please read about African Americans, understand this, the, the background of this country. You and I as educated, overprivileged Indians can walk in here and get great jobs. Thanks to of course our effort and our work also, but we have an advantage that I don't think many people ever stop to think about and they take it all for granted. So many people, not everybody obviously, but so many people do. Let's just look at your comments coming in. Uh, Charles says, I watch Fox News only to see them making fools of themselves. Apollo says, preach Professor Sinha. Alyssa says, thank you. Uh, Apollo says, someone 
from the Robert Trump funeral party punched and broke a restaurant server's nose after being asked to wear a mask. I mean, just think about that. Ellen says, you're correct on Fox. Apollo says, uh, that's smart. We'll support boycott RNC convention. And Eves Botello says, I, uh, I so agree. Uh, this has been amazing. Thank you so much, Manisha. Professor M. Sinha on Twitter, everybody, please follow her. Check out her book, The Slave's Cause. And then, of course, we will have her back whenever her book is ready. Academic work takes some time, but we'll have her back, I hope, if she's willing to come back and talk about politics as we get closer to the election. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me, Sri. Thank you. Bye-bye. And that was our amazing session about the Postal Service and how we can save it. It saved the U.S. Postal Service Day, folks. Let's save it. Our guests were Richard John and uh, uh, Manisha Sinha, both professors of history who helped put a lot of this in context. I want to tell you what's coming up this weekend. We are very busy on the weekends around here. We have five shows that we do. And I want to tell you, in fact, six counting the show we do on, uh, on, on Friday nights. So here's what we did on, on, on the show. Uh, so Friday night, we talked about education and where we're going from there was the K-12 roller coaster. We met parents who are working to decide what to do with their children and the opening of school. Dr. Janet Taylor was with us, a psychiatrist as well. And then we have uh, tomorrow, we uh, have at 8.30 in the morning, please join us as we read the Sunday New York Times as we do every single uh, every single Sunday we do this because we want to understand what is happening with the po uh, uh, with the news. And our guest tomorrow is John Byrne, uh, founder and executive editor of editor in chief of Poets and Quants, and the former executive editor of Business Week and top editor at Fast Company. So please check that out. That's 8:30 a.m. Eastern time on all these channels. And then at 11 a.m. Eastern time, we have She's on Call a wonderful show uh, produced and hosted by Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar and Marina Kurian, two surgeons in New York, and their guests, Dr. Doris Day and Valerie Fitzhugh, a dermatologist and a pathologist. That's 11 a.m. Eastern on Facebook. Please follow them. And then at 9 p.m. Eastern, every Sunday, we have Positivity Night, despite all the rotten things going on. Our guest is Judith Matloff, who has one of the most unusual titles of any book you'll ever see. How to drag a body and other safety tips you need to, you hope you, you hope to never need. Survival tricks for hacking, hurricanes, and hazards life may might throw at you. So check that out. She is she teaches crisis reporting at Columbia Journalism School. That's at 9 p.m. Eastern time on Sunday. And then every Saturday, I have a call-in radio show on WBAI, where we talk about uh, coronavirus and we call it Coping with COVID-19, a helpful, hopeful call-in show, Saturdays noon to 2 Eastern on WBAI 99.5 FM, Progressive Radio in New York. Our guests are Lauren Block and Adam Block, co-authors of Kelly Goes Back to School, More Signs on Coronavirus, and Elizabeth Chu, who is the executive director of Columbia Law and the Center for Public Search, Research and Leadership, at the Columbia Law School. So check uh, that out. You can watch on, you can listen on 99.5 FM in New York and anywhere on the world in WBAI.org. WBAI.org, you can join us. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Thank you for your support, your questions, your comments. This is the background of our show. Big thanks to our producers, Rose Horowitz, 31 and Vandana Menon, Vandana underscore Menon, and uh, to YouTube for hosting our archives, youtube.com slash Freenet. Hit the subscribe button and check out scroll.in and scroll global, which transmit our, and, and simulcast and host our shows. Big thanks to our sponsors, nonbelievable.com, divinely delicious cookies on a mission. Each handcrafted cookie provides a meal to those in need. One cookie equals one meal, nonbelievable.com, 20% off with the code 3 S R E E and fundamentals of social media, a free course for everyone. Free certification now available, mrac.co slash social, mrac.co slash social. More than 4,000 people have taken that course. 
and so should you. And right behind me, you see a copy of the book, Fauja Singh Keeps Going, the true story of the oldest person ever to run a marathon. And that's a book by Simranjit Singh. Simranjit is at SikProf, S-I-K-H, P-R-O-F on Twitter, and he'll be a guest on our show along with the, his team that put together that book. So watch for that in the weeks ahead. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for your time, your energy, your support. We are so grateful to all of you. And please uh, be in touch. Sri at Sri.net is my email address. And we work on virtual events. So if you would like a talk show like this of your own, we'd love to make you one or you would you need help with your virtual events, please contact us, sri at sri.net. We can help you. We've done events for 50 people and 100,000 people. Your event, I presume, is somewhere between those numbers. So please be in touch. Thanks very much, everybody. S-R-E-E -E at S-R-E-E.net. If you'd like to uh, get another way to get in touch and know when we're live, we have this, uh, this QR code. You can just hold up your phone and you'll get a gentle WhatsApp alert, not a WhatsApp group, but a gentle WhatsApp alert when we are live. Check that out at this uh, at this QR code. And uh, if you once you're done with this show, you can watch the recording right now, and you can also watch Spin It Social. Let's get let's talk photography and social media. It's already started, but you can also check out the archives. Stefan Spin It Social, my friend Stefan Kaplan, my colleague. Uh, talking to Jennifer McClure about photography and social media. Check them out and uh, and understand all these great stories that need to be covered. Uh, Paulo says, uh, please come back to talk about uh, those discussions on the Civil War and Reconstruction. That will be great to uh, have her back. And uh, let's see who else is here. Uh, Charles says, great show, Sri. Thank you. Uh, 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 Charles is my... Uh, family friend of my New Jersey godfather, and this is his book, The Inventor in You by Charles Cunnan Carroll. Please check out the archive, uh, for archive to find his show from a few Saturdays ago. I know you will learn a lot by uh, taking a look at this book, a step-by-step -step guide to your first invention. I know you uh, will learn a lot. And Shago says, thank you, Sri, for doing this. I try to catch it whenever I can. Missed the first part but the conversation with Professor Sinha was excellent. Thank you. And it's all recorded and all available at youtube.com slash Srinet. And uh, Paulo says, thank you, Rose, uh, Sri and Vandana. We'll rewatch from the top. I am so grateful to everybody for joining us and for being here. Thank you so much, everyone. We'll see you. Bye-bye. And please email me. We'd love to be in touch. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>